Hello everyone, welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today I'm going to introduce you to our newest Altium project, and that is for an NFC transceiver board. This board is based on ESP32, and I know what you're all thinking. Hey Zach, you hate ESP32, right? But I wanted to create something that was gonna be accessible for a lot of the designers out there because of course, a lot of you like to use ESP32. So we're gonna show you this NFC transceiver board and it looks a little something like this once it's finished. Make sure to hop into Altium and follow along and let's get started. In this video, we're gonna be showing you an NFC transceiver board project. And this project is actually gonna be introduced over two videos. So in this video, we're gonna show you the schematics and the PCB layout. And then in the next video, we'll run over some testing and we'll see if this board actually works. So the board that I have for you today is basically a board just like this. It is based on an ESP32 and the TRF7970A chip from Texas Instruments. Now as an NFC transceiver chip, the TRF7970A allows read and write from a writable tag. We're using this just as a reader in this project, but of course you'll have access to all of the source files and the source code for this project. So just check the link in the description for all of that good stuff. So before we get into the schematics and the PCB layout for this design, I wanna just briefly introduce what all of this stuff is supposed to do. So in this board, we have the TRF7970 chip here in the lower corner. We have a UFL connector that will connect to an off-the-shelf uh, NFC antenna. And then you can use a commercially available tag, such as one that's available on Amazon, to then trigger the device. Now, the other factor that triggers the device is a button, just like this type of button. So this is a panel mount button, and it plugs in over here in this side of the board. And then using the NFC tag and the button, you can then trigger a relay on the board. That relay then provides power to an external device, such as a motor driver or an actuator or any other external device that you wanna to toggle with this board. There's also a 12 volt power pass-through. We have wide input voltage on the input side, and then we have various power regulators to regulate the power to the voltages that we need in this design. Now the main star of the show in this board is the TRF7970A chip. So let's take a look at some of the specs for this NFC transceiver. You can see here, I'm on the Texas Instruments website. This is a multi-protocol, fully integrated, 13.56 megahertz NFC transceiver. And this is actually part of a family of part numbers that supports various NFC standards. So there isn't just one NFC standard that you have to worry about. But here in this design or in this uh, example that we're going to show today, we're looking at a design that uses the ISO 14443A standard. So you can see here on the page, they have several standards that they list. And we have the ISO 1443A and ISO 1443B. So the ISO 1443A has a range of up to four centimeters. And that's the standard that we're gonna use. So that's the type of NFC device where you would take a tag, like a card or like a little key fob, and you would bring it right up next to the reader. And then that would toggle the device to begin operating. Now there are these other standards that do offer longer range if you need it. One of them is the ISO 15693 standard. And that standard offers up to one meter to one and a half meters maximum range. These other two standards, the ISO 18003 standard are also long range standards. So the ISO 18003 standard goes from 10 centimeters to one meter maximum range. And then the 18092 standard goes up to 10 centimeters maximum range. Now I'm not familiar with this JIS X6319-4 standard but hey, if anyone's ever used it, make sure to leave a note in the comments. Now, if we scroll down here on the page, we do have some hardware and software development resources that we can access, and there are some reference designs that you can use to integrate this NFC technology into your design. Now, the software development resources are, of course, very useful because you can get some firmware examples from this list of resources and then use those to build your own application with this type of device. Now, with this being a short range reader, one thing that I did was I recently went on to LinkedIn and I made a post about possibly extending the reach of the ISO 
1443 standard using a different antenna. Most of you who follow me on LinkedIn left some really great comments about this. There are some folks who have done this in the past, either using a larger antenna or just by cranking up the output power on the power amplifier that's built into this chip. So we have a lot of really great comments on here. And if you're not following me on LinkedIn, make sure to go find me on LinkedIn and follow for all of these great discussions and design resources. Now, because the power amplifier stage for this NFC chip is built onto the chip, it is programmable. So the power output can be set in one of the registers in the device. So that is going to allow us to do a little bit of testing with the power output when we take this device and start doing some testing in the next video. Now, if you build this design yourself and you want to get a little bit of extra range out of this device, you may have to use physically larger NFC tags and an NFC antenna that is physically larger. This is because these tags rely on magnetic induction in order to trigger the transceiver. And so because of that, a physically larger tag and a physically larger coil will have larger inductance and that will allow for just a little bit larger range for detecting the magnetic field. So now let's take a look at the schematics for this design. Here you can see on this first page, we have the ESP32 microcontroller that we're using for this design. As you can see, this is not the ESP32 module. We're using the actual microcontroller. And like I said, I don't hate all ESP32 designs. I think this is a good one for the folks out there who wanna have something that's really accessible that shows the right way to use microcontrollers in a four layer board. This design uses the ESP32 Pico D4. And you can see here that we've taken the RF output and run it over here to a UFL connector that allows you to connect a 50 ohm antenna to this design to then access the Wi-Fi capabilities. I wasn't intending for this design to be used with Wi-Fi. Again, it's just an NFC reader, but if you want to take this design and run it over Wi-Fi, you're certainly free to do that. Next, just zooming out here, you can see that we have a switch on the board. This switch here is used to toggle the enable pin. And then here you can see this switch on the board is connected to IO0, which is of course used to toggle on programming. We also have a header here so that we can access IO0 if we wanna use it as a regular IO. Or of course, you can then use J2 as a switch as well, just by bridging the two pins on J2. And then that will also put the device into programming mode. Next, let's jump ahead a little bit and look at the input power stage. Here, the input power supply is designed for 10 to 24 volts input, although you could probably push that 24 volts limit a little bit. Here, because we have an input voltage going to a wire hole and then our ground going to the wire hole, I'm thinking I'll probably put some reverse polarity protection on this design, and you'll probably see that in the next video. And we'll build a new rev with this, with some of the changes that get applied in this design. Here, you can see the voltage input goes to a Texas Instruments LM5176 power supply. This then outputs at 12 volts. So pretty straightforward design. We also have, as I mentioned earlier, a 12 volt pass through on a couple of wire holes. So you can take that 12 volts output, send it to another design if you like, and then you could toggle something on that other design using this NFC reader board. Next, we have a couple of other power supplies. Here you can see we have a 12 volt to 5 volt power supply, and then we have a 5 volt to VDD or 3.3 volt power supply. This is for our logic levels, so that's pretty straightforward. You can see here that we also have some LEDs in this sheet, and then we also have a four pin connector that allows us to access the UART uh, interface on the ESP32. Then here in this page, we have the relay. Here you can see the relay part number. This is a TE connectivity relay. And you can see here how this is toggled. This is just toggled with an NPN transistor. You could also toggle this with a MOSFET. Here we have an additional IO from the ESP32, which could then be used to toggle one of the buttons or one of the settings on the push button that's attached to this board. So I wanted to design this originally to be used with this push button. And then we have some other switch outputs from the ESP32, which then also toggle transistors and can be used to toggle an external device. And finally, we have our RFID sheet. Here you can see the RFID sheet 
contains our transceiver. So here is the TRF7970A transceiver chip. You can see we have a lot of I.O. coming from the ESP32, and we have some capacitors here for the various power rails. And then here we have a connector that is then connected to our external antenna module at 50 ohms. That is a UFL connector for our NFC antenna. Finally, I just want to talk briefly about the matching network. Here, this matching network separates the TX out and the RX in signals coming into this TRF chip. And then you can see here we have our 50 ohm output going to our connector. So this particular matching network does come from the reference design. Of course, you are free to design your own matching network, and I encourage you to go ahead and do that if you build your own prototype. So that covers everything in the schematics. Let's take a look at the PCB layout. So here in this PCB layout, I have done a four layer board. And this four layer board is done with everything on the top side. So you can see here, this is what the back side looks like and this is what the top side looks like. Now, why have I done everything on one side of the board? Well, I floor plan this in such a way that we would use a ground plane on layer two. We have all of our standard digital stuff and our IOs on the top layer. And then on layer three, we have a lot of power routing, which then routes to all of our various components in this design. Now, the power routing is not really mandatory from a current perspective, although the input power supply can handle a pretty good amount of current. So if you needed to pull a lot of current through that 12 volt power, pass through, you absolutely could do that. And I haven't done a test of what the maximum current is in this design, but we'll go ahead and test that in the next video when we actually get a prototype back of this revision, and then we'll go ahead and see what the maximum current it can output is. So really only one of these rails is designed with high current in mind, but that means the rest of these rails are really just designed for convenience. And because we're able to fit most of the IO and all of the chips up on the top layer, and we have a solid ground plane on layer two, I think it's okay to then also put power on layer three. So this is one of those instances where we have a signal, ground, power, signal type of stack up. Now, if you look on layer four, you'll see here that we do have some additional signal routing on layer four. However, if I turn off my top layer and my middle layer, and then I turn off these component layer pairs, you can then see what some of this routing looks like. So a lot of this routing that comes from the ESP32 is actually being routed over this power rail. So you can see here, we've routed a lot of these signals right over this power rail without any issues crossing over some of these splits between these power rails. Now we do have one signal right here, which does pass over this split. However, you see here, this is the blue LED signal. So it's basically just gonna switch on, and because it's in series with a resistance, it actually switches on quite slowly, and then it just provides DC power to that blue LED. So there's really no risk of large radiated emissions or anything like that from this blue LED signal. And of course, if we have some problem with susceptibility or we just wanted to be extra cautious, and eliminate any chances of problems with susceptibility. We could of course take, for example, this power rail here in the upper right, and you can then just drag this back, for example, over here. Then you could drag this rail over to the right, and that would put this signal over a complete piece of copper. Now you can see here that there are three other signals that pass over this split between these two power rails. And if we zoom in, we can see what those signals are. We can see that one of them is the relay toggle signal. We see that one of these is just a switch signal. The other is also a switch signal. So if we go back to our relay sheet, we can see what those signals are connected to, we can see that they are connected in series with a large resistance. So you can see we have these three resistors here, and those basically just toggle on transistors. And those transistors are gonna to toggle on slowly thanks to, of course, the fact that you have a series resistance on these lines. So again, because these lines are gonna to toggle on slowly once they reach up to this part of the board, that is going to eliminate any risk of potential radiated emissions as well. It's okay to do this, especially when you have signals that are toggling on slowly themselves, or they're connected to a large series resistance that's also going to toggle on very slowly. 
Now we have one more of these switching signals right here along this bottom part of the board. You can see that this is switch one and in the relay uh, schematic sheet, you can see where switch one is, it's right here. It is also in series with a large resistance. So it is also going to toggle on slowly. So here, because switch one is expected to have also a low edge rate, this routing over this split between these two power rails is not really expected to be much of a problem. Now let's just look at some of the placement overall from a high level view. Here you can see that we have the ESP32 microcontroller. Here we have our four pin header to access the UART interface. Here we, uh, at U4, we have our input power supply that regulates down to 12 volts. You can see here where we have our FETs and our inductor in that circuit, and we have our input and output capacitance. And then over here, we have our two rails that regulate down to our five volt output and our 3.3 volts. Finally, over here is where we have the TRF chip. This TRF chip has its output connector located right here. I should probably put a little RF out tag right here above J8, because that is where the RF output is. And then here we can then connect to an external antenna module, which is then going to be used with our NFC tags. Now one potential design change if we were using a printed antenna instead of J1 would be to take U1 and rotate it counterclockwise by 90 degrees, and that would put a printed antenna along this lower board edge. And that would be good enough to keep it away from all of these other components. But because this also is a coaxial connector and it connects to a small cable with an external antenna, we don't really need to worry about it in this design. We can leave it right here in this part of the board. Next, let's take a look at everything that's along the right board edge. Here at K1, you can see that we have our relay and then our two connection terminals that can then connect to an external device. This set of holes is used for this push button switch. So when you download the project files, you'll see a wiring diagram with this part number listed and it shows all of the wires on this part which then connect to the terminals that you see here on screen. And then here, if we scroll down, you can see that we have our 12 volt output. This is our pass through. I'm considering moving the 12 volt output up to this corner so that it's closer to this 12 volt out right here. And I may do that before you download the files and before this video is published. So don't be surprised if you see this 12 volt output move up to the top right corner of the board. Last but not least, we have our fabrication drawing that has all of our important fab data. You can see here, I have two holes that are listed that I haven't provided tolerance for. So I'm gonna have to go back into the PCB layout and put those tolerance values in for these two holes. You can see here we have our stack up details and then you can see here we have our fabrication notes. So this is going to be a 62 mil thick board, one ounce finished, and we're gonna have Enig as the surface plating. So for this design, it is operating only at 13.56 megahertz. Enig is not going to create appreciable loss, even though it is a lossy material in RF devices. If we were operating at much higher frequencies, such as 13.56 gigahertz, we would definitely use a different plating material. So if you wanna learn about those plating materials in RF devices, make sure to check out the link in the description to watch another video. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and you'll be able to get notified once the second video in this series comes out, where we will do all of the testing and bring up for this design. As always, make sure to leave your comments and questions in the comments section, and don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. We'll see you next time.